participants, the seminar is about to begin. An honorable guest and esteemed professors and my fellow students, welcome to join the seminar series here by the College of Business and School of Law. I'm Lucas, an year three student majoring in computational finance and financial technology from the College of Business. It's my pleasure to be your master of ceremony for today's event. On behalf of CDU, I would like to welcome all of you to this seminar series. The joint seminar aims to facilitate innovative idea exchange between professors and students across different faculties and areas of study. Students are encouraged to think outside the box through engaging with emerging technologies to create innovative solutions for the sustainable future. And today we are extremely fortunate to have Prof. Virginia Hapoho to deliver the seminar. Professor Hapoho is a professor of law at the City University of Hong Kong. Her research focuses on the intersection of corporate governance, finance, and securities regulation from a comparative perspective. And she has written recently on shareholder activism, ESG disclosure, and regulatory and corporate governance aspects of sustainable finance reform. She has recently contributed to ESG reform initiatives led by the Singapore Exchange, the Security and Exchange Commission of Brazil, and the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Today, Professor Hopper Ho talk is titled The Informational Challenges of Sustainable Finance, Implications for Investor Stewardship and Investor Protection. Market demand is rising globally for investment products and practices that take environmental, social, and governance factors into account. And regular regulators in leading capital markets are also introducing new compliance and reporting obligations for institutional investors and asset managers as a part of a sustainable finance transition. Meeting with these uh, demands requires clear standards and comparable information from corporate issuers. Yet in most capital markets, both are emerging, diverse, and even contested. In this lecture, Professor Hopper Hall will explore the shifting regulators and landscape of ESG investing from a comparative perspective and discuss the key challenges asset managers and investors in diverse capital markets face in implementing ESG sensitive investment and engagement strategies in line with investor stewardship expectations and involving compliance demands. One of the most fundamental challenges at present globally has to do with the limits of ESG information that corporate issuers report, as well as underlying questions of the scope and goals of reporting operations. This lecture presents an analysis of recent policy developments, including the US SEC's recently proposed climate risk disclosure rule in comparative context and considers the prospects for international harmonization to adjust the informational limits investor phase in the sustainable finance transition. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Harper Ho, please. Thank you, Lucas, for that introduction. And thanks to all of you for taking time out here at the end of a busy semester to join me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Um, hopefully that worked and you can all see the uh, slides okay. Um, as, as Lucas mentioned again, today my focus is on the informational challenges of sustainable investment. And before I get too much further, there's a bit of background noise in my office, so I apologize and hope that's not too distracting. Um, before I get started, I'd like to say a little bit about where this fits in, in the kind of broader work that I'm doing. And um, if, you, if you look at this slide, what you can see is, if, as the introduction suggested, I'm kind of focused on corporate governance and green finance, but there's a lot of different aspects of this, part of which are very important to us here in Hong Kong. Uh, certainly there's the comparative aspect with the developments in the mainland surrounding green finance regulation. In addition, uh, this area is one that really does sit at the intersection of securities regulation of uh, the financial rules governing asset managers and investors, uh, as well as broader questions about how we can address climate risk and other types of environmental and social risks, uh, not only from a, a standpoint of corporate governance, um, but in terms of thinking about the intersections of different kinds of regulation, whether that's vol voluntary standards, corporate social responsibility, uh, other forms of private ordering, or, or indeed what we might call hard law. Uh, so that's kind of the perspective that I bring to this topic. Um, 
so today, my, my goal is really, uh, as you heard in the introduction, to, to introduce us to recent policy developments that are affecting uh, ESG-oriented investing internationally, and uh, particularly to focus on the information challenges for asset managers and investors. Uh, what I'd like to do is to, uh, again, also share a very recent development, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, the SEC back in March of this year has just released uh, climate disclosure regulations. And I think that it's very useful for purposes of my talk today to look at those rules as a kind of uh, example or illustration of some of the challenges that really confront any effort to think about ESG integration in investment and in finance more broadly. So um, I'd like to introduce some of the key features of those proposals and some of the challenges that they highlight as well. And then I'll conclude uh, my remarks by highlighting some of the outstanding corporate governance challenges uh, of the sustainable finance transition. We don't have time to talk about all of those today, uh, but there's a number of aspects uh, where law and governance uh, intersect. And so I'd like to highlight a few of those for you as well. Uh, so I'd like to start out, um, I guess I, I have a slide in here about some of my prior work. I think I've already talked about that. You'll see some references to some of these papers. I guess what I'd like to say at this point is that this will be a little different from a traditional research presentation uh, in that I'm gonna be drawing on several prior papers as well as the broader literature on sustain sustainable finance ESG disclosure, and again, the governance role of shareholders. So I'm gonna be pulling from a lot of this prior work rather than presenting uh, to you today, uh, the you know, hypothesis and, and findings from a particular project. I'd like to start by kind of setting the context though, uh, for those of us here in Hong Kong, uh, as many of you may know, Hong Kong is positioning itself as a green finance hub. And this is uh, set out in a number of recent uh, statements and, and policy directives including uh, the two most recent climate action plans from 2017 and this past year, as well as the Greater Bay Area Development Plan, uh, which speaks to um, the uh, goals of furthering green finance and Hong Kong's role in that transition. Um, there's already a number of organizations and institutions that are actively involved in this space. I know some of you, uh, even those of you who are students may well be familiar with this. Um, the SFC and the HKMA have already introduced uh, steering groups and working groups to focus on this. And the Hong Kong Green Finance Association is already pulling together many of the key players uh, in the financial sector to be thinking about this in addition to the work of the Greater Bay Area Green Finance Alliance. So from both kind of a policy standpoint, as well as a practitioner standpoint, uh, there's a lot of work that's already being done. Uh, on the right-hand side of this slide, what I've done is, is highlight some of the key um, guidance or initiatives in this space, particularly those uh, that are focused on questions of ESG reporting and disclosure. Uh, so you can see that uh, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange has obviously been active in this area. The three at the top are the, are the developments in this space. Hong Kong was among the first, in fact, to introduce uh, stock exchange guidance, uh, which became uh, mandatory in part in 2016. And it's also, as of last year, revised its guidance on climate disclosures as a number of other stock exchanges and markets have done. Um, and that was a part of a broader process of revising the corporate governance code and the listing rules. On the bottom of the right-hand side of this uh, slide, you can also see some reference to some of the developments in the mainland that are going to be important in this space. Uh, one of the most interesting ones, I think, is the EU-China Common Ground Taxonomy. That's the third one down there. And basically what that is, is an effort to harmonize or uh, find compatible, a compatible core between the standards that are being developed in Europe for green financial products and other green compliance objectives and uh, the existing standards that China has developed for the green bond market. So there's a lot of things that are happening right now. Uh, another one at the top of that section, the uh, CSRC, the securities regulator in the mainland, uh, last year it, uh, revised information reporting uh, uh, gui um, guidance, but also mandates for annual reports uh, affecting uh, companies listed in the mainland exchanges, and it includes a number of ESG reporting elements. Uh, so that's kind of the, the context in which we sit. Um, in terms of what's driving all of this, there's obviously a market context here, and, and, and in terms of 
the directionality of this, we can talk about that later. Uh, but one thing to note is that there's been a dramatic rise in the total assets under management that are uh, reflecting ESG factors to some extent. So we might call those ESG integrated uh, funds or investments. Um, and these include traditional uh, funds as well as specialized ESG focused uh, funds. And so you can see the, the projected demand is also expected to rise uh, even to as high as uh, 30 trillion US dollars uh, in the next decade. So there's a high market demand uh, for green investment products. And as many of you uh, may also be aware, the green bond market that I mentioned earlier is also growing significantly. And China is obviously a big player in that market. Uh, some of you may also have been following the news earlier this week. Uh, on May 16th, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority announced the subscription results and allocations for the first ever retail green bond scheme. So those of you who are uh, investing on your own account uh, may have uh, paid attention to that. Uh, but it's a uh, 32.5 billion Hong Kong dollar retail green bond scheme. And again, very innovative in attempting to uh, bring in retail investors into this space. So anyway, a lot of market demand going on. Um, and we might ask, well, why would in institutional investors, our large investors, and I guess retail investors too, as well as asset managers be focusing on ESG. So again, as kind of a background to the disclosure or reporting piece I wanna talk about, I'd like to say a little bit about kind of what's driving this um, from an investor standpoint. And one of the big uh, reasons for this, for those of you that are not uh, focused on this issue, is risk management and risk analysis. So uh, if we're thinking from the level of a portfolio, portfolio ESG risk effects. And there's a lot of research that's been done on this to highlight the ways in which uh, ESG matters. And one of the, the first ones that you see here is that ESG risk has been found to, per, uh, to affect portfolios systematically. Obviously, um, that's the kind of non-diversifiable risk. And the idea is that our largest investors, those the largest institutional investors, essentially are not are, are invested across the, the market, right? Uh, so they bear that risk. And it's a uh, risk that if externalized from one firm is going to re be reflected in the uh, risk adjusted returns of another piece of the portfolio. And so uh, there's a number of authors recently that have pointed out uh, that this is risk that is ultimately borne by uh, our, our largest investors. Not to mention the, the systemic or economy-wide impacts of climate risk. And this is obviously something that's been much in the news in recent years, and most regulators around the world have started to put out numerous reports about the potential risks, um, volatility, and, 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 and systemic other kinds of systemic risks uh, to the markets. Um, the citations I've got here are from some of the leading uh, agencies in the, SEC, in the US that have uh, finally <laughs> begun to notice these issues and to, to really talk about what needs to be done in, in, in this regard. Uh, the third is that there's a substantial body of research, uh, for some coming out of COVID, uh, by Al Albuquerque is, and, and his group is one. Uh, there are others who have found that integrating ESG factors into a portfolio can cushion or provide a kind of insurance effect in times of significant uh, downturn that might be otherwise uh, fairly significant to the market as a whole. And, and again, COVID is one example of that. The financial crisis of uh, about a decade or so ago was another. And certainly uh, if climate risks materialize uh, drastically, that could be another circumstance where these kind of insurance effects become helpful. Uh, and then of course, there's investors who are interested in promoting environmental or climate friendly or other ethical uh, types of, of objectives through their investments. And so a values-based investing uh, or uh, social responsible and impact or SRI investing is another driver of this. In addition, uh, there are investor, quote, stewardship or oversight obligations in many jurisdictions, as well as new compliance obligations for asset managers. And one of the examples of this that's uh, gotten a lot of attention is the uh, SFDR uh, regulation in the EU, which applies specifically to uh, asset managers and requires disclosure of ESG impacts uh, related to that, those uh, funds and portfolios. So that, that's kind of the second reason. Um, those are drivers and kind of positive sources of demand. Uh, 
The third thing on here is really a constraint, and there are regulatory constraints uh, on investors taking a more active role in overseeing the environmental and social risk of the companies they invest in. There are also regulatory constraints in some jurisdictions, most notably the US, on the ability of investors to work together in engaging uh, with the firms they uh, are invested in. So you'll, you'll see a lot of leading asset managers speaking out or talking about the engagement that they're doing, but there are some regulatory constraints on cooperation or collaboration, uh, at least in the US. Uh, and in addition, there's a question of fiduciary duties uh, for investors under many regulatory regimes. Uh, my understanding is that in Australia, there, these fiduciary duties may point in the other direction and may actually require in some circumstances uh, ESG factors to be considered. Um, Freshfields, the law firm, uh, did a pretty famous study back in 2005 on this issue, kind of surveying globally and found that on balance, most countries do not have an affirmative obligation for investors to take account of ESG factors. And in fact, in some jurisdictions, uh, there's resistance or restrictions on that. Uh, the US is right now in the process of updating some of its guidelines to provide more flexibility possibly in this area, but it tends to swing back and forth uh, you know, from one administration to another. When we get a new president, it moves in one direction when, and we get a different president with a different persuasion, it goes in the other. So it's been an area of some instability and that's left a lot of questions in the mind of investors as to whether they're even allowed to incorporate ESG factors. So this is kind of part of the of what's driving uh, and in a sense also constraining ESG integration. Um, so before I get too much further, I wanna kind of pause a bit and think about, well, why should ESG matter to investors here in Asia where the dominant ownership structure involves controlling shareholders and firms uh, with largely uh, concentrated ownership? Uh, and so there's, uh, this, is, this is widely recognized. And in fact, there's been some work on the question of investor stewardship. In other words, the power of investors to use their voting power and other governance rights to influence how corporations approach ESG risk. And uh, there's, there's been a number of studies that have observed that this kind of notion of stewardship, uh, which has come out of the UK and been embraced uh, really globally um, is, is really not a good fit perhaps here in Asia. It's not clear what incentives uh, controlling shareholders have to monitor ESG risk. There's some work that's needed to be done in that area. Um, mitigating uh, ESG risk for companies is likely to be profit sacrificing to some extent, although it might have uh, uh, operational and, and risk again management benefits in other areas. Um, but in Asia, there's not really the kind of active role of investors, particularly institutional investors, uh, other than hedge funds, uh, to the extent that we see in markets like the US or the UK. So, you know, does ESG matter here? And my answer to that would be yes. Uh, the first, you know, four or five points here on the, on the bottom of the screen are similar to the ones we've just discussed. I mean, Globally, we are all looking at exposure to, to climate risk and the materiality of climate exposure uh, for all investors. And so uh, controlling shareholders are equally exposed to that risk almost regardless of sector, although the level of exposure does vary um, by sector. We might have majority or controlling owners that are particularly uh, personally focused on ESG uh, externalities, on climate impacts, on the impacts of the corporation, on employees and other stakeholders. And so they might care for those kind of reasons as well. Um, and again, some of the financial benefits of focusing on ESG risk we've already discussed. In addition, particularly because of concentrated ownership, um, our controlling owners might be less diversified in some sense, and so therefore might be more concerned about some aspects of ESG risk. We also need to think of minority shareholders in this context. You know, so one of the strongest agency costs that we worry about for controlled uh, firms is what about the minority shareholders who are going to be exposed to some of these risks uh, and may not have any way to know what risks they're exposed to. So that's a reason for better information about ESG risks. Uh, even in a controlling shareholder dominated environment. In Hong Kong, of course, uh, listed companies 
among our listed companies are uh, state-owned enterprises and affiliates of state-owned uh, uh, firms in the mainland and, and elsewhere. And there, there's almost also a public policy dimension to this as well. And so we could argue that uh, for certain investors, particularly the state, uh, there might be a public policy alignment with some of these ESG objectives. And that could be a reason to encourage companies uh, to focus more on climate or other environmental and social factors. And then lastly, as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, our current moment is one in which we're really experiencing a kind of international hardening, if I could use that word, of, of guidance and other kind of soft or voluntary regimes around ESG becoming much more mandatory. And that's really a trend internationally. And so as owners of companies and as companies who are involved in the value chain or the supply chain of other companies, these compliance obligations become relevant as well. Um, so here on the slide, I have a couple, um, you know, just kind of logos or slogans here um, of some of the major actors or players in this space that are defining what, what information reporting on ESG looks like. And they're very, very actively involved in thinking about what a, a, a sustainable finance transition looks like and how to move us forward in that direction. So it really, we are looking really at a shifting regulatory framework. And this is really perhaps one of the most important drivers of ESG integration in all markets. And it is pushing companies toward greater transparency around climate and other ESG risks, um, both directed at investor transparency as well as corporate transparency. And, and again, some of the leading frameworks uh, a couple of which I'll be talking about in a bit, um, are the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure Standards, that framework. And in addition, uh, this year, the IFRS is working through its International Sustainability Standards Board to uh, promote and introduce uh, what it hopes will be international and internationally recognized common standards for sustainability reporting and, uh, in particular, climate disclosure. Um, that would be aligned with and incorporated into uh, a right alongside financial reporting. Um, so this is kind of what I'm talking about with some of the regulatory, kind of a regulatory hardening. And again, a lot of this uh, regulation is focused on disclosure, but some of it is ultimately designed to change corporate behavior to improve how companies monitor and manage these risks. A uh, number of examples, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but Europe has been particularly active in this area. And so if you just kind of look at the dates on this slide, uh, you can get a sense of just the level of activity in this space. And that's partly because the European Union, um, like China and other juris jurisdictions, has a kind of comprehensive uh, roadmap for sustainable finance reform. And so a number of these developments are related to that. The ones that are pending right now that are really uh, critical, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive in the middle of the slide, um, a final report on a social taxonomy or definitions that we can use commonly in investment for social risks um, has just come out this year. And then there's a, a due diligence directive that many of you may be familiar with that is also going to be dealing with some of these broader sustainability issues and is directed really at the corporate level. Um, so there's a lot of, of work that's being done. Um, these kind of regulations, again, are part of the broader context of information reporting and transparency and investment, uh, but they really reflect a lot of divergence in regulatory goals. And I think that's really important to remember, particularly when we're looking at different tools that regulators might use to move forward in this space. Uh, the, the goals that we're trying to reach uh, really do matter. And, and so I'm, I'd just like to walk through a couple of these. Uh, most importantly, you might think, uh, is reducing climate externalities, right? Changing corporate behavior, changing investor behavior to align them with the UN Sustainable Development Goals or other sustainability goals that might be important at a regional uh, or even national level. And so this is what we might call regulation by disclosure, right? If you make people report something, they might change their behavior, they might focus on these issues more. And so that could be quite helpful. Um, in changing how we approach climate generally. Um, secondly, a major objective of some of this regulatory hardening is by a recognition that markets do not uh, price ESG risk uh, well at the present time, and that we need to direct capital flows uh, 
and be able to direct capital flows more toward green investments and green projects and away from less green or even black or, or brown projects. And so this kind of capital, uh, capital allocation goal is very important. You see it reflected in some of the policy statements uh, by the Hong, Hong Kong Monetary Authority, as well as uh, by the PBOC in the mainland, uh, by European regulators and others. Um, the OECD's estimate is a little dated now, about five years back, but it estimated at that point that we would need 6.9 trillion US dollars in investment annually until 2030, which is coming up on us, in order to meet the Paris commitments. So, you know, maybe that number is changing now. I wouldn't be surprised if it's higher, but um, that's a significant amount of capital that needs to be directed in a more sustainable way. And we need to know, uh, how, you know, how to measure that and, and reporting as part of that. The third uh, goal here is market competitiveness. Again, that's a big focus for the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. As governments around the world are looking at this, all capital markets need to be considering how do they keep uh, abreast or keep current with this. That's another driver behind the SEC's reforms of this year. Um, it used to be that the argument was, well, competitive markets point the other direction. Firms won't list uh, in our market if we are too strict uh, with some of these sustainability requirements. Really, the, the momentum is the other direction now. And so some of the um, justifications that, that you'll see if you look at the SEC's proposal uh, is you know, we need the US markets to be competitive at a time when capital markets globally are incorporating these kinds of standards. Uh, the fourth one here is one that I promised to talk about today, which is investor protection uh, and market stability. Uh, the climate uh, impact piece of this uh, really does have potential systemic effects. So that, that raises those market stability concerns. The problem with information that's available right now generally on ESG also really uh, pushes on an investor protection rationale too, uh, because uh, regulators are concerned that investors are not getting accurate information about the ESG characteristics of the investments that they're purchasing or the financial products that are claiming to be green. So kind of a greenwashing issue. Uh, so again, lots of governments are looking at that, including uh, mainland regulators. Uh, and then finally, this idea that uh, we really need to mobilize investors, particularly large institutional investors, as stewards of the corporation. So this is kind of a corporate governance motivation to push companies in a more sustainable direction. And we need information to allow them to do that. The idea, again, is that active ownership or shareholder activism will lead to better governance outcomes and lead ultimately to better climate and ESG risk management responses uh, from companies. So I've managed to make it for about a half an hour without even talking about sustainable finance. And I do have about 10, 15 more minutes or so uh, to talk about the details uh, of uh, some of the rules and give you some examples. Um, but I'd like to highlight something that might be obvious from the last slide, which is, you know, what are we striving at when we're talking about sustainable finance? And really, I think the EU has put, has really summarized well what these objectives are. So I hope you can see from what I've said so far that there really are kind of two overlapping core goals. The first one is sustainable development and climate mitigation. And you can see that the EU statement here, sustainable finance is about two imperatives. The first is to improve the contribution of finance to sustainable and inclusive growth, as well as the mitigation of climate change. The second is to strengthen financial stability by incorporating environmental, social, and governance factors into investment decision-making. Um, these two are related uh, in that both require retooling financial systems. So that's why we're talking about a sustainable finance transition. And how do we need to do that or why? It's so that these systems can effectively price climate and ESG risk, and again, direct capital, capital to sustainable uses. And this capital allocation goal is one that was recently highlighted uh, by Hong Kong's Secretary for the Environment back in 2020. Uh, the Secretary said, green finance not only unleashes capital for combating climate change and tackling environmental challenges, but can also foster our growth as a low carbon economy. Okay, so the question is, do we have the data? Do we have the information that's needed to get there? Okay, so finally, I've reached uh, the, what I promised to talk about today, which is the informational challenges of getting there, the informational challenges of a sustainable finance transition. 
And I've written about this in the past. So some of my prior work that was on the earlier slide um, unpacks what some of these limitations are. Um, so I'm just going to walk through these pretty quickly. Uh, the first of these, again, is the concern about green finance, greenwashing. So we'll put money into something that's called a green investment or says that it's a bond that's going to finance green projects, but then it really won't do anything or it might even cause harm. And we won't know because there's inconsistent definitions and standards. And uh, those have proliferated largely uh, through private standard setters, but also from uh, regulatory authorities. In fact, at this point, there are 70 different governments worldwide that are regulating in this area, and many are using different standards, although there is some convergence, as I talked about before. Um, another big issue is just information asymmetry between companies and investors, as well as across the market. And there's a lot of literature coming out right now about ESG ratings. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but Ratings have been recognized to be internally inconsistent based on uh, measures that are not transparent and not even to be internally consistent over time. So there's a lot of good studies that are coming out about that, really raising some of the challenges with ESG data. I don't think it's surprising given the inputs that we have to work with, right? If companies are not putting good data into the system, even the best rating system is not going to work. Not to mention that we have a proliferation of standards uh, and, and ratings out there. In addition, there's a lot of work that's shown that at the corporate level, at the reporting company level, companies themselves have blind spots around some of these key ESG risks, particularly with regard to climate. So if you think about the scale and complexity of most modern corporations transnationally as well, um, if we think about value changes, supply chains or uh, product development, all of those things become more complicated. And again, there's a lot of fragmentation of standards resulting in poor quality of reported data. A lot of this is also information related to risk that companies may not want to voluntarily disclose. So for a lot of reasons, we don't have good data going into the market. And again, this raises a lot of concerns. Uh, furthermore, we don't really have a good handle at the corporate level of how to even report on something like a systemic risk, like climate risk that is not, um, particular to the firm itself. So where does that leave us? That leaves us with some constraints on investor stewardship, again, the ability to use those government governance tools, as well as, again, investor protection concerns and real limits on what we can do to price climate risk. So that's kind of the problem. Um, to illustrate some of this and to begin to think about some of the solutions and, and some of the issues that we have to confront to solve these challenges, I want to turn to just get a brief overview of the new SEC regulations that have just been proposed. I think this might be of interest to some of you since it's pretty new. Uh, and in fact, in the US, uh, you know, lawyers and uh, companies and their advisors and uh, other policymakers are still working through this. And so we don't know what the final form of it will be, uh, but I thought it might be helpful to just summarize a little of it so you can see where some of the possibilities are for global harmonization and standardization, and also where some of the points of tension might be in different markets. Um, I'll first warn you, if you want to read this, the whole document, it's on the SEC website, but it's about 500 pages long. Okay, so don't read the whole thing. It's mostly commentary and explanation of the rules themselves, which are you know, probably 10 pages or something like that. So yeah, the, the rules themselves are quite concise. Uh, the document itself is not. Um, but the purpose of these regulations would be to supplement what is already um, the federal uh, securities disclosure regime. So it would be adding new uh, provisions to those existing obligations. And it's important because this is the first time that the US Securities and Exchange Commission has done really anything in this area since 2010. So there's been a long while of no action in the US and this is really uh, one of the first steps. Another interesting piece about this is that it is intentionally designed to follow and uh, conform to the TS TCFD International Climate Re uh, Reporting Framework that I mentioned earlier, as well as the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which many of you may be familiar with, uh, which is an internationally recognized reporting standard. Uh, it also encourages, but does not explicitly base uh, the provisions on um, industry-specific materiality standards that have been put out by an organization called SASB. And SASB is important because it is now uh, informing that um, 
broader international reporting standard that I mentioned that is forthcoming from the ISSB. The goals of this proposal are, uh, as you can see, the goals of all securities regulation in the US to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and promote capital formation, but specifically not to address climate-related issues generally. So that's interesting. Um, it can indirectly have that effect, but the purpose of the SEC's rules is not to fix climate change. It is, however, to improve the consistency comparability and reliability of climate related disclosures. And again, as I mentioned, it very intentionally and explicitly aligns with existing international climate frameworks and is anticipating uh, forthcoming ISSB international standards. And so the hope is that these would align. There's questions about whether there might be some tension between the two, but I think the SEC's goal is to do something that will align and be harmonized with the uh, forthcoming international standard. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see some of the quick and dirty details. It applies to US and foreign issuers. The information will be provided in a registration statement or in the annual report. So with other uh, information for directed at investors. Uh, it, it will take effect if adopted uh, next year for the next fiscal year, which would be reported uh, data in 2024. So the reporting cycle of 2024. Um, and again, it's uh, focused on climate specifically. It does include uh, greenhouse gas reporting, scope one and two emissions, as well as scope three, which is indirect emissions, only if they're material or if the company has set scope three targets. So it does not mandate scope three reporting if the company has not done that. Uh, but scope one and two, scopes one and two are mandated. And it also uh, requires reporting against the TCFD recommendations uh, in the four core areas of the TCFD, which are governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets. So if you end up looking at the rules, what you'll see is that the SEC basically took everything in these small boxes. I'm not gonna use a pointer, but if you're looking at the slide, you see the four boxes at the top, those are kind of the main principles. So those have become mandatory in the SEC's proposal. In addition, the guidance and recommended disclosures at the bottom of the screen, they're recommended in the TCFD, but they are mandated in large part through the SEC's proposal. So that's something that's been quite heavily debated in the US right now. And a lot of the lawyers that are looking at this issue are, are uh, questioning whether that's the right approach, whether that's too prescriptive. Um, but if you wanna, if you just look at the TCFD, you can get a, a very clear sense of what are some of the mandates that the SEC has just introduced. Okay, so just real briefly, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but just to give you a sense of what are some of the basics, uh, it requires disclosure of board oversight and governance of climate related risks. It requires disclosure how the climate related risks identified by the company have had or are likely to materially impact the company's strategy, business model, or outlook over the short, medium, and long term. And it requires the company to define what those time periods are. It also has some new financial disclosures under regula Regulation SX on financial impact and expenditures. Again, I talked about the greenhouse gas emission disclosures. A big question is about reliability and assurance. And uh, these disclosures, as some of you may know, the financial reporting is audited. Okay, but most of these requirements do not fall within the financial statements. They fall within the other non-financial disclosures under Regulation SK. However, the greenhouse gas emissions are proposed to be subject to mandatory assurance on a kind of phased basis over time. Uh, so you can see that for lar the largest companies, which are accelerated filers, um, they will be filing uh, assurance or attestations of assurance for greenhouse gas emission accuracy uh, in 2024. Uh, and then ultimately in full in 2027. Uh, other companies are not required to provide that. It, uh, one of the concerns is the cost of obtaining that kind of assurance. Um, some of the most interesting pieces of the TCFD and what we might want to, what we might want to focus on as investors if we care about climate risk um, are arguably voluntary. And I say that because they're only required to be disclosed if the company is doing them. So one of the concerns is if we require disclosure in this area, will it discourage companies 
that aren't doing this yet from doing it. Now, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think if you're doing something like this, you should tell investors about it. But in this transition period, it is an open question. So here's an example of the things that the SEC has said you only have to report if you're already doing it or if you have these things. So for example, processes for identifying, assessing, and managing climate risk. How these processes are integrated into your risk management. Metrics and targets. Okay, again, if you don't have any metrics and targets, you don't have to report them, you don't have to create them, but if you do have specific metrics, you need to report them. Transition plans, something investors will be very interested in. How is the company planning to transition to a post-carbon economy? Well, again, you only need to disclose your plan if you have it, and then you need to provide other details about that plan that might be of importance to investors. Internal carbon pricing, as many of you know, the U.S. is not interested right now in a carbon tax. Uh, it really has very little uh, prospect for success, but many companies are already creating their own internal carbon pricing. And so the idea here is if you're doing that, you need to tell investors about that, um, as well as some of the detail of how you're calculating that and uh, the disclosure and the pricing needs to be in terms of um, currency per metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is an international measure. Scenario analysis, another thing that many of you know is, is maybe one of the un most unique features uh, of considering climate risk is getting companies to tell us how resilient their business would be under different climate scenarios. And that's something that investors um, are interested in. But again, you only need to provide that information if you have done that work. And if so, you have to disclose what the parameters are. The SEC has not set any baseline scenario uh, uh, parameters that would be part of that analysis uh, for different sectors. Climate related targets and goals. Again, you don't have to disclose those unless you have them. Uh, and then again, scope three or indirect G, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are only uh, required to be disclosed if you think that they are material to your business. Okay. Couple very quick other interesting elements. It does, this disclosure is the first that covers not only the consolidated reporting company, but also its value chain. And that's consistent with the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, upstream and downstream risks. So inputs and outputs, uh, consumer related risks. It covers actual and potential transition risks. There's also some phase-ins and exemptions for small, small companies. So small public companies don't have to report on greenhouse gas emissions for a number of years and they don't have any reporting or attestation requirements for scope three. There's nothing in this on executive compensation there is also some protection for litigation, uh, but it is limited. It only covers forward-looking but not historical information, and it is not a safe harbor for enforcement from the SEC. What I mean by a safe harbor is if you fall within the boundaries, you can't be sued by an investor, but you could still be subject to some kind of administrative enforcement um, uh, by the SEC if the information was fraudulent, for example. There's a couple odd things in here uh, that maybe are not odd to some of you. Um, for example, um, some things that are of concern to some of the companies uh, and lawyers that have looked at this is it requires that you identify a postal code or a zip code for every physical climate risk in order to better get geographic uh, clarity, query whether that is necessary or helpful. Um, it requires a lot of detailed disclosure uh, and categorization of climate risk, which is uh, understandable. Uh, it has a somewhat interesting focus on flood and drought related risks, but not other kinds of specific climate risks. So some have commented on that. Um, for those of you less familiar with the US context, one way to understand some of this is that the US uh, regula regulators have to be thinking about litigation and litigation against the regulator challenging the regulation as invalid and unenforceable on either administrative or constitutional grounds. And in the past, SEC regulation has been struck down or modified on both of these grounds. So what are some things that we can see here that are evidence that the SEC is preparing for a court challenge? First is that it doesn't, this rule doesn't actually mandate reporting on corporate impacts on the climate or the environment. Right? It's all about risk impacts to the company. 
So primary materiality, if you're thinking from a, a securities regulation standpoint, not secondary uh, or double materiality, which is really what we care about if we're thinking about you know, climate impacts. Um, number two, it doesn't mandate any particular governance practices because if it were to tell companies you have to introduce this kind of corporate governance system for climate or ESG, it might be viewed as overstepping its regulatory authority in some way. Number three, as I said, it doesn't set any specific parameters that companies must use for any of this kind of climate governance, and it avoids mandatory quantitative requirements. It encourages them, but it doesn't require quantitative reporting. It also avoids mandating targets or progress, disclosure of progress toward those targets, although it encourages them. It tries to lower the compliance cost for small and medium enterprises, particularly smaller reporting companies. And overall, I think we can say that it is trying to reduce litigation risk without compromising disclosure quality. So I know I've been speaking for a long time, so I wanna just very quickly um, run through a couple slides about what does this tell us about some of the broader challenges, informational challenges that face a sustainable finance transition. And I've put these in a couple categories. The first one is conceptual. And then I wanna talk a little bit about uh, legitimacy challenges and then technical challenges. Uh, and then I'll wrap up for today. So just really quickly, some of the conceptual challenges you can see from what I've said so far. Big question is what exactly are we asking companies to measure? Are we focused on risks to the company? Are we focused on portfolio level risks or economy-wide risks that investors may care about? Are we actually focused on risks to the environment or to the climate? Okay, that's uh, called double materiality. And that's the standard that's been adopted in Europe um, as well as to some extent by the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and in Singapore. Um, the SEC, as well as the forthcoming international standard, do not adopt a double materiality standard. They focus only on risk to the company itself. And you can see that in some of the quotes that I've got here. Again, um, the one that I put up earlier from the SEC's rules itself, it says, the commentary says, our objective is to advance the commission's traditional mission, not to address climate-related issues more generally. Um, however, in the EU disclosure regulation that's forthcoming, it defines double materiality and reminds us that it is concerned about both financial materiality and materiality with respect to environmental and social impacts. The other conceptual questions we got to think about in this area are which factors do we care about? So right now markets are focused on climate, understandably, but there's other environmental factors we might want to include. And thirdly, in terms of scope, do we cover only public companies, only listed companies? Do we cover others? Do we cover um, small and medium-sized enterprises? How do we get at that when those companies might not be public or subject to the listing rules in different jurisdictions? So these are some conceptual and scope-related issues. Um, I don't wanna spend a lot of time here because I wanna leave time for your questions, but if you look on the left-hand side, um, there's a lot of variation internationally in how different standards deal with these issues. Um, at the top, you can see the US approach. Um, in terms of whether the standard is mandatory or voluntary. The ones at the top are mandatory. Uh, we do have a lot of voluntary standards out there. Um, most of these standards cover primarily listed companies. However, the European standards are broader than that. We might need to think about moving more broadly if we really want to cover all of the uh, concerns about climate impact. And then these standards vary in terms of how broad they define sustainability or climate or materiality. And so you can see some of that variation elsewhere on the slide. In terms of legitimacy, the question is here, who gets to decide uh, what matters and what we should report, okay? And again, that's because sustainability is a broad concept, right? It can be defined different ways by different companies. And some of these factors may be measurable and others are not. So should we ask corporate boards to decide? Should we let them continue to make the materiality judgment? Should we, as Hart and Zingales recently recommended, ask shareholders to vote on what they care about and what they really want to hear about, um, or ask them to put a, together a proposal to the company's board to direct them? Uh, what about regulators? Most markets have taken this approach because it, it's fair, 
uh, and reasonable and reflects policy goals. What about stakeholders? Is there a way to involve the rest of us in defining what companies should report um, beyond our elected officials or regulators themselves? And then what about private standard setters? So a big question again, broadly in this space is who gets to decide? And then uh, finally, there are a number of technical issues that are uh, very important. Um, one has to do with the nature of sustainability information. It's very subject to uh, estimations and assumptions. Um, it may be of lesser reliability. And so there's a greater demand for assurance. But again, those estimates, as many of you in finance know, tend to drive the numbers. And so you know, how we measure that risk is, is difficult. And there's not really one way to do it. Again, another part of the technical challenge is fragmentation in terms of standards. This is evolving. The SEC's uh, recent rules are part of that. Another third technical challenge is about investment chains. How do we get from uh, firms' clients, uh, so an a fund or an in investment manager's clients, um, its shareholders, its beneficial owners, these are all different constituencies. Uh, and are they getting the information they need to make informed decisions? And then finally, how are these things enforced? Are they enforced by the market? Are they enforced by shareholders? Are they enforced by regulators? So these are all very important technical issues that all markets need to deal with. Uh, and lastly, there's a number of things that are beyond the scope of what I'm talking about today, but there's large literatures really questioning the ability of investors to play an active role in how companies behave and in pushing them to manage uh, ESG risk. And again, as I mentioned, I, and I've written in other papers, there are a number of legal and institutional constraints on the asset manager and investor side that may restrict what they can do in the ESG space. We need to think about what to do about that. So in conclusion, I've just wanted to kind of wrap up what I've talked about today. I know I've been speaking for a while, maybe longer than you're used to, um, but I, we've, we've already gone over some of the informational demands of sustainable capital markets. We've talked about some of the constraints on regulators, uh, and uh, we've talked about some of the ways in which climate risk is being addressed. Um, we've also talked about the ways in which information constrains shareholder monitoring. And we've also talked about the effect of this bad data on investor protection and market stability concerns. I've just now highlighted some of the conceptual legitimacy and technical challenges. And I do think that there are strong prospects for harmonization and convergence in this area, particularly with the work of the SEC recently, as well as the work of the IFRS it, with the forthcoming uh, climate and sustainability standards. Ultimately though, the big question is, does this get us there? Does this get us far enough if we're just focusing on kind of the business case or working within kind of traditional parameters? How can we think more aggressively and more creatively about helping companies to really uh, internalize uh, those external climate and environmental and ESG risks. So I'm going to stop there and I welcome your questions. So I think that we have one of our MCs is going to help us. I don't really have control of that. So I'll yeah. turn the floor over to, to you, Lucas. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Hopeho. And uh, the floor is open to any questions. Is there any questions? And also, I'm not able to see the chat. So, Lucas, if anything's uh, been put into the chat, feel free to facilitate. Yep. I, um, So if there's no questions, uh, this is the conclusion of the joint seminar event today. And once again, I would like to express our deepest gratitude towards the generous support and presence of our honorable guests and participants. I would like to thank our guest speaker, Professor Hapo Ho. Thank you all for your participation in this event and we look forward to seeing your attendance at future events. Thank you. Thank you all, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you.